Praise the Lord, everyone. If we could all stand. This summer, it feels like I've been out of town more than I've been in town. And Kelsey and I were talking about that, and we were saying we haven't been here in a while. Well, we were here last Wednesday, but it doesn't feel like it was last Wednesday. And I'm telling you right now, I just need some church. And we were at dinner tonight, and we were, they were talking, and Dad goes, you know, Nick, I didn't even get a preach on Sunday. And I go, man, that must have been a good service, and I missed it. But then I remember, it doesn't matter because it's the same God on Sunday that's here tonight. And there's no place that we would rather be on a Wednesday night than in here. So if we could just start this service off with praise and worship and tell God there's no place I'd rather be tonight. No place I'd rather be. No place I'd rather be. No place I'd rather be. Here in your love. Here in your love. No place I'd rather be. No place I'd rather be. No place I'd rather be. Here in your love. Here in your love. Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. So much more. nothing worth more that could ever come close no thing can compare you're our living hope your presence Lord 
Everybody. Amen. It's good to be in God's house tonight. Hallelujah. Feel in the presence of God like we feel right now. Hallelujah. I'm so glad for His presence. Amen. What, wasn't it a wonderful prayer meeting? Amen. At 7 o'clock to 7.30. It's tremendous. Amen. And so we've got a prayer list tonight that we have several people that we need to be praying for. Quite a few actually. Uh, won't list them all, but uh, just listing a few. Uh, we need to remember uh, Sue Duncan tonight, Sister Birchfield, amen.
Amen. And uh, Sister Cindy uh, needs prayer. And Brother Beesmer is not with us tonight, but he is very much in need of prayer. And uh, Sarah Wilcox, uh, Debbie Jeffers, and Doris Taylor, and uh, several families that are listed here that need a touch from Almighty God for a healing. And we can believe God for a healing touch this evening. We understand that it's by His stripes that we are healed. Amen. We can stand on the word of the Lord and claim that in the name of Jesus. And of course, uh, quite a few people that are listed for in need of salvation. We need to always pray for the lost, right? We've all got loved ones. We've got all got friends, relatives, co-workers perhaps that need salvation. Let's pray that God's spirit would touch their hearts and their minds and draw them by his spirit into this church. Amen. And they can feel the presence of God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. So uh, if you have a special need or request, just raise your hand right now. God knows all about that. Let's take these all to the Lord in prayer right now. Jesus, we love you tonight, God. Oh, we're so thankful tonight, God, uh, for the great privilege and the great honor, Lord, uh, that you've given us, God, to call upon you and worship your name, Jesus. God, and to have that assurance from your word. God, as we bring these needs and requests before you, Lord, uh, you're going to hear and answer our prayers. Uh, God, I pray, Jesus, for all these uh, in need of a physical healing, a physical touch, God. Oh, Hallelujah, Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. And uh, we would like for Sister Beesmer, if you would come bring these uh, throughout the week to the Lord. Brother Brent's going to bring those to you. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Now is the point in the service where uh, we receive the opportunity for God to meet and supply our needs. So if you have a need tonight, whatever it may be, we'd like for you to come forward tonight. And uh, Pastor Johnson will anoint you with oil. Amen. And we'll pray for you and believe God together. Hallelujah. Amen. Several who are coming. If you need a touch from God tonight, God's here and he will touch you. Hallelujah.
on now. Now, now you can hear me. Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Uh, good to see Tina back with us tonight. Thrilled to be back. Yeah, had a good visit today. Went, actually went to visit Tina and ended up visiting with Archie, and uh, which is her dad, and had a real good visit with, with her dad. Uh, he, is, he is a young 89 years old. And, and I was really impressed when he remembered who I was. Because I hadn't seen Archie for years. And uh, he, re he remembered who I was. And I was really impressed by that. So I must have left some kind of impression a, couple, a few years ago. <laughs> Amen. Good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. If you would stand with me, I want to read from the word of the Lord. I had so many things running through my head today as far as what to, what to teach on, what to talk about um, tonight, and just a variety of things that, um, so I kind of put them all together. So we'll see how it comes out. It's been in the oven a while, so it should be pretty good by now. But uh, you better, better pray for me tonight. The Lord help me. 2 Timothy chapter 1, and one verse, verse 6. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 6. Paul the apostle telling Timothy the young man, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance. Obviously he had been told this before. He said, I want you to remember that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. Now I want us to go to the Old Testament, to the book of Joshua, chapter 14. Joshua, chapter 14. I want to start reading at verse 6. Joshua 14 and verse 6. When you get it, say amen. Joshua 14, verse 6. Then the children of Judah came unto Joshua in Gilgal, and Caleb, everybody say Caleb, the son of Jephunneh the Kenizzite, said unto him, Thou knowest the thing that the Lord said unto Moses, the man of God, concerning me and thee in Kadesh Barnea. Forty years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land, and I brought him word again as it was in mine heart. Nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me made the heart of the people melt, but I wholly followed the Lord my God. Now let me read verse 8 again. Nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me, that would be the other, there were 12 spies, two of them came back with a good report. Caleb was one, who was the other one? Joshua. Joshua and Caleb came back with a good report. The other ten came back with a report of doubt, a bad report. Matter of fact, the Bible at one place calls it an evil report. He said, but I wholly followed the Lord my God. And Moses swore on that day, saying, surely the Lord, or surely the land whereon thy feet have trodden, shall be thine inheritance and thy children's forever, because thou hast wholly followed the Lord my God. And now behold, the Lord hath kept me alive, as he said these forty-five years, even since the Lord spake this word unto Moses. 
while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now, lo, I am this day fourscore and five years old. So he's 85 now. He was 40 when the Lord spoke to Moses. He's 85 now. As yet, I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me. Now, I, I read that and I just said, wow. I'm as strong as 85 as I was at 40. God bless him. As my strength was then, even so is my strength now for war, both to go in, out and to come in. Now, therefore, give me this mountain. Where the Lord spake in that day, for thou heardest in that day how the Anakins were there, and that the cities were great and fenced. If so be the Lord will be with me, then I shall be able to drive them out, as the Lord said. And Joshua blessed him, and gave unto Caleb the son of Jephunneh Hebron for his inheritance. Hebron therefore became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh the Kenizzite, unto this day, because that he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. And the name of Hebron, and the name of Hebron, Hebron before was Kerjeth, Kerjeth Arba, which Arba was a great man among the Anakins, and the land had rest from war. Who were the Anakins? They were the giants in the land. Matter of fact, Hebron was the birthplace of Goliath. That's where Goliath came from. I want to preach to you, talk to you, minister to you in the next few minutes. Revival must be personal. Revival must be personal. Let's pray. Lord, in your mighty name, let my mind be anointed. Let my words and let be anointed, God, by you that I may preach the word. That, God, I may minister, God, what you have delivered on my heart, placed on my heart. And I pray, God, by the hand of the Lord, God, that you minister this day through the power of the Holy Ghost and the anointing of God. Lord, we give you all the praise, all the glory. We lift you up, O oh God, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lift your hands to the Lord one more time. Lift your voices to God with praise. Lord, we magnify you. We glorify and we worship you, God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Blessed be your mighty name. God, let your anointing, let your power, let your word come forth with authority. Hallelujah, Lord. We bless your name, oh God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In Jesus' name. Will you help me out tonight? Will you help me out? Amen. You may be seated. Sometimes we lack a clear understanding of what real revival is. We get the idea that revival is a week-long series of services with a a designated evangelist and special singing, and and when we we put that, we put revival on the poster, and 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 we've done that, and and that's that's an awesome thing, and and but revival is so much more than a week of services. Revival's more than than something uh, that we the put across as a banner across our platform as our goal. We we do desire revival. We want revival. We want the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. We want the outpouring of the Spirit of God. We want the glory of God to fall. We want deliverances to take place, salvations to take place, people getting the Holy Ghost, people being baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. But for revival in the kingdom to happen, revival must first become personal to every single one of us. I've known some great men and women of God over the years and have been privileged to travel with some and, and to rub shoulders with some and some men and women of God that are very sensitive 
to the Holy Ghost, very sensitive to the direction of God, and men and women that are easily led by the Spirit. The Bible says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And, and so I, I've been privileged to, to be in services and be in meetings with some of these folks. And some of the, I'll tell you, some of the ones that are the most sensitive uh, to the Holy Ghost are new converts. Boy, new converts can be very sensitive to the Holy Ghost. They, they, they get that, that spirit of the Lord in them and the Holy Ghost filling them up. And, and all of a sudden, they've got some kind of sensitivity, least, least little thing, and they're moving. I love to watch a new convert. I, I, I do. I love to watch a new convert. They're exciting to watch. Now, some of us, we get too Pentecostalized. Hello? We, we get Pentecostalized. We, 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 we get kind of in a routine and we get in a, in a spiritual rut and we kind of stay there. We, we, we kind of get in our routine and that's where we are. We know when to lift our hands at the right time. We know when to say amen at the right time. We know when to stand up at the right time. But man, you get a new convert and you just read the begats and the word of God and they're ready to jump up and say hallelujah, praise the Lord. I love watching new, they have no fear. New converts have no fear. They, they have a boldness. I don't know where that boldness comes from. But they're full of the Holy Ghost. They got faith for anything. They'll believe God for anything. You, would, you want somebody with faith to pray for you, find a new convert and let them lay hands on you and pray for you. They got, they got faith. But some of us are professional Pentecostals. And we need to kind of break out of that mold. We need to get out of that routine. We get out of, a, out of that rut. I've heard it said a rut is nothing but a casket with the ends knocked out. We need to be less Pentecostalized and more spirit filled. What would happen? What would happen? Because when you get Pentecostalized, then you start worrying about what people are going to think about you. You get Pentecostalized, you start thinking, of worrying about what people are going to say about you. What would happen if we, would, if we had no fear of that? What would happen if we had no fear of rejection when we went out witnessing to people? What would happen if we had no fear of criticism and all we was concerned about was hearing the voice of the Holy Ghost, hearing the voice of God, listening to the voice of God? Too many have lost their spiritual edge. They, they've lost their spiritual edge, and, and we need a revival that's personal. That's why, that's why Paul, when he wrote to Timothy, when he wrote to Timothy in, in the Scripture, and he, he was encouraging him and directing him, he said, stir up the gift of God that is in thee. He said, thou stir it up. He, he didn't say, uh, schedule some special services. Go look for a special evangelist. Well, wait for that special Sunday morning. He said, no, you stir it up. You see, you've got the gift. The gift is in you. You stir it up. This has got to be personal, Timothy. This is something you've got to do. See, this thing, this thing started out personal. When you got the Holy Ghost, and there's no, no, no more important thing that can happen in your life than that you are born again of water and of spirit. There is no greater feeling in your life than when you realize that your sins have been forgiven by God and covered by the blood of the Lamb. Your name is written down in the book of glory that you are now a child of the Most High God. That is the single most important thing that can happen in your life. It's the single most important thing that you could ever, ever hope for. And I don't care how religious you are. Uh, you, you must, you've got to be born again. I, I, I don't care how well you know the Bible. You've got to be born again. I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't care what church you've got your name on. You've got to be born again of water and of spirit. <laughs> except you are born again. The Bible says if you're except you're born of water, that's being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. 
and except you are born of spirit, that's being filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. The Bible says you cannot, you cannot enter the kingdom of God unless you are born again. You've got to be born again. And there are people that are born again. Born of the water and of the spirit. Good people. Godly people. But somewhere along the line, they've lost the spiritual edge. Somewhere along the line, they've become routine in their worship and routine in their walk with God and routine in their prayer life. And I'm afraid that there are too many people that sit in our churches that have become that way. I'm talking about born-again people. I'm talking about baptized people, full of the Holy Ghost people. They've reduced to where some things that the gifts, like Paul told Timothy, the gifts are, they need to be stirred up. Yeah, usually when something needs stirred up, it's kind of settled to the, to the bottom. It's kind of just kind of gathered there at the bottom. And you start stirring it up. And you start, start getting that moving all over again. I, I'm, I'm reminded, I'm reminded of the man talked about in the book of John, John chapter 5. He, he was uh, a man that was impotent. He would go daily to the pool of Bethesda and lay by the pool. And uh, Bethesda means the house of mercy. And he would go there and, and, and he there would be a great multitude of people, impotent folks, the Bible says, that, that were there. And I'm talking about it would, there would be the blind and the halt and the withered and, 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 and the lame and all of that uh, all gathered around that pool. And I, I'm sure there were new people every day coming in, in, into that group of people that were there waiting for the moving of the water. They're, they're, they're just waiting for the water to move, waiting for their miracle because one time a year the water would move. One time a year an angel would come down and the water would be stirred and they would jump into the water and, and they, they would receive their miracle. And there's a, there's a lot of folks that are, are, are waiting for the moving of the water, but Paul didn't tell Timothy, wait for the moving of the water. Paul didn't tell Timothy, wait for something special to happen. Paul didn't tell Timothy, wait, wait for so-and-so to come. Paul said, you need to stir up. Timothy, stir it up. Stir up the gift of God that's on the inside of you. You've got it, Timothy. You've got it, but it's got to be stirred up. You've got it, but it's got to be moving around. You've got it, but you're not using it. You need to stir up the gift of God. <laughs> Timothy, it's not enough. It's not enough just to receive the gift. But the gift's got to be active in your life. It's not enough just to receive the gift. That's the easy part. Receiving the Holy Ghost is the easy part. But that gift has, has to be stirred up. It has to be moving. It has to be activated. And it's evident that Timothy was responsible. Timothy was the one responsible for keeping the gift stirred up. Let me tell you something. It wasn't just Timothy that's responsible for keeping the gift stirred up stirred up. T.J. Johnston's got responsible for keeping the gifts stirred up. And, and, and you're responsible for keeping the gifts stirred up. It's not just me. It's all of us in this place. We have a responsibility. Let me put it this way. You've got a responsibility to keep the fire burning. Look, look at somebody. Look at somebody and tell them you're the keeper of the flame. You see, it's on the inside of you. You have it. There is no doubt you have it. You are in possession of the greatest gift ever given. You are in possession of the greatest gift ever poured out. You've got exactly what you need. You don't need anything else. There's nothing that's got to go with that. You've got the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's God in you. That's the Spirit of God residing on the inside of you. But I'm afraid sometimes, I'm afraid sometimes that there's a whole lot of apostolic folk, Holy Ghost filled folk, who are also sitting back 
waiting for the moving of the water. There, there, there's some apostolic folk that's kind of gathered around the pool. And they're waiting for the moving of the water. They're, they're, they're waiting for the right service. Or they're waiting for the right song. Or they're waiting for the right evangelist. Or they're waiting for the right revival. Or they're waiting for the right this or the right that. And they're waiting for the move, moving of the Bible. They're waiting for somebody else to come along and stir it up. They're waiting for somebody else to come along and stir up that gift that's on the inside of them. They want to hear somebody speak some kind of word over them. It's going to tell them something. Let me tell you something. You don't need a word. You got the Holy Ghost. You got it. You've got the power. You've got the anointing. You've got the spirit. Hallelujah. And the fact is sometimes you just got to stir yourself up. Remember David? David came back to Ziklag and everything was gone. Everything was gone. Their, their, their possessions were gone. Their, their wives were gone. Their families were gone. The enemy had come into their camp and taken everything. And David sat down in the midst of all of that. And David ripped his robe and covered himself with ashes and Oh, that's all signs of mourning. And, and, and he, he did that. The Bible says he inquired of the Lord. And the Bible says he encouraged himself. He encouraged himself in the Lord. You know what he started doing? He started remembering every victory God had brought him through. Started remembering the lion and the bear and Goliath and the, and the Philistines and all these victories that David had come to. And he remembered that if God was God of those victories, God is God of this victory. Sometimes you got to stir it up while we're waiting for the water to stir and waiting for the right song, God's waiting on us to stir it up. Or we're waiting on another preacher or a right evangelist. The Bible says if you'll draw nigh to God, if you will, he will draw nigh to you. You draw nigh to God, he will draw nigh to you. It's you coming closer to God. It's you, oh, I want, I want a closer relationship with God. Then start drawing nigh to God. That's it. It's that simple. You start getting closer to God, and God's going to start coming closer to you. And that, that's the relationship you have with God. That's stirring it up. That's stirring up the gift of God that's on the inside of you. That's stirring. you got to agitate it sometimes. Sometimes you got to agitate it. Stir up the anointing. Stir up your faith. Stir up your worship. Stir up your prayer life. You got to stir. You got to agitate it. Get it moving. Hallelujah. When we lived, my family and I, we lived up the holler, Princeton. We had chicken coop out back, about our extent of uh, living on a farm with them and chickens. And they had fence around it so the, so the dogs couldn't get to the chickens and all that. Go up there, and it was just an old, old fence. And there was an old gate you had to open to get in. And it was just one of those old metal gates, you know, with the wire going all around it. You all seen it. You all seen these gates. It was rusty. It was old. And it took, I mean, it took everything to open that gate. It took all, all the, and, and sometimes I just had to stand there and shake it and try to shake it loose, just to break it loose enough that I could, that I could get that gate open. And then I, I'd have to just pull on that gate just as hard as I could just to get it wide enough for this skinny little scrawny little boy to, to walk it. Yeah, I was then, Carl. I was skinny and scrawny. But you were you knew remember gates like that, don't you? Yeah. Get trying to pull those gates open and try try to get in there and 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 to feed the chickens or to get the eggs or whatever it is I was needing to do at that time, but to get in there. And sometimes you got to put forth the effort and you got to get a hold of the horns of the altar and you got to say, God, I got to stir this up. God, I got to have the spirit moving on the inside of me. God, I got to have the power of the Holy Ghost for out of my belly shall flow rivers of living water. 
too many times we get too close to the fire going out before we start stirring things up. But if you can just find some hot coals underneath the ashes, if you can just find some hot coals. I don't know how many times our fire, our, our buck stove at the house has almost gone out and I go get some logs and bring it in, open it up and all I see is just dark ashes. But I get in there with the, with the poker and I start poking around and, and all of a sudden I've got a little, little red embers here and there and it is still, there's still some smoke going on and so that and I put a little kindling in and put that wood in there. Before long that fire is roaring because it just took a little stirring. It just took a little stirring it up. We need a fresh wind from heaven. We need a fresh wind from heaven for God to pour out a fresh breath upon us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Bible says in Acts chapter 2, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it set upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them others. There appeared unto them tongues like of clo cloven tongues, like as a fire. See, the wind and the fire go together. The wind came from heaven, but the fire sat upon each of them. Each of them. Everybody say each. Because it's personal. When you got the Holy Ghost, it was personal. You got, you got it. You got it. God gave it to you. He filled you with the Holy Ghost. He washed your sins away in the waters of baptism. It was you. It was personal. And the wind came from heaven, but the fire, the fire sat upon each one of them. Each one of them had the fire of God upon them. And sometimes it's the fire that needs to be stirred. It's the fire that needs to be revived. It's the fire that has to be moved. Oh, tonight. Oh, somebody stir it up tonight. Let's stir it up tonight. Let's stir up what's settled in the bottom. Let's, let's stir up that, that, that anointing. Let's stir up that faith. Let's stir up that, that prayer life. Let's stir it up. You can't stir up something you don't have. The fact is you've got it. You've got it, and you've got to stir it up. Timothy, this is something you've already got. Timothy, you've got to do this. You've got to do this yourself. Don't have to wait for something new to happen. Don't have to wait for some sign or some cloud to appear out of heaven that looks like a flame, but just stir it up. It's what's on the inside of you. You know, it's interesting that before Paul told Timothy to stir up the gift of God that was on the inside of him. His first letter had a different tone. First Timothy had a different tone. Chapter 4 of 1 Timothy, Paul's warning, warning him about latter days and seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And, and he's encouraging Timothy and telling him, don't let anybody despise your youth, Timothy. And, and be an example. And give yourself to reading, to exhortation. To doctrine. And in the midst of all of those encouraging words, 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 14, Paul says this Neglect not the gift that is in me. You want to know why that old gate around our chicken coop was so hard to open? It had been neglected. Nobody oiled the hinges. I didn't know anything about oiling hinges. Nobody, nobody checked that, that uh, class that held the gate to make sure it was easy to move. It wasn't. It was neglected. And when you neglect, you neglect things, it's kind of like neglect the house. Well, eventually, it's going to fall down. Neglect your car. Eventually, it's going to stop running. Neglect, he told us, neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy. With the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. I wonder if Paul, if God had already kind of given Paul a little wisdom and discernment, knowing that there would be a time he would write to Timothy and tell him, Timothy, you got to stir it up. I told you not to neglect it, but now you got to stir it up. 
I told you not to overlook it and forget about it and take it for granted. But now you got to stir it up. Folks, don't take anything with God for granted. Don't take your prayer life for granted. Don't take your church for granted. Don't take your worship for granted. Don't take your, don't take your fasting for granted. Don't take your faithfulness for granted. Because the devil will try his best. He will try his best to get you in a place of lukewarmness. Lukewarmness, we could talk about that in the church of Laodicea. We, it, where you're, he said, I'd rather just spit you out of my mouth if you're lukewarm. I'd rather you're hot or cold. I could deal with you if you're hot or cold. But when you're lukewarm, you think you're in, but you're not. You think you're okay, but you're not. The devil wants to get us in a state of lukewarmness and in a state of indifference. And he will try his best to, to get you there. He may not be able to get you with addiction. He may not be able to get you with fornication or adultery. He may not be able to get you with, with, with this or that. But he can, if he can just get you in a spirit of indifference, a spirit of complacency, where, where a spirit where, where you, it, you, it, you just kind of settle in and just going to ride your way through. And you, you just kind of settle in there and just go on. We need to wake up. <coughs> we need to wake up. We need to wake up and understand we got to stir up the gift of God that's on the inside of us. Now, I got to tell you, Caleb's one of my heroes. I, I love Caleb in the Old Testament. Caleb's a, Caleb was awesome. C Caleb had something in him where he stood there on that day when they come back with the report. Uh, they had walked over into the promised land, and Caleb comes back and says, we are well able to take the land. We could tell you they're standing there. They two guys, it took two guys to carry the grapes. With the, they brought them back over. He said, surely the land flows with milk and honey. It's everything God said it would be. Let's take the land. But the other ten spies, the other ten spies said, no, there's giants there. There's fortified cities there. We can't do it. We are grasshoppers in their sight. He said, we can't do it. We're not going to be able to do it. And, and you know the story. They didn't do it. And God got very angry with them. And Moses actually had to go before God and defend them. Because God was ready to destroy them and start over. And, 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 and Moses stood in place and interceded for them and stood in the gap for them. But Joshua, Joshua stood there and, and as they're, God, God is telling them what they're going to do. They're going to have to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. That whole generation is going to have to pass before they can enter the promised land. And, and, and Joshua standing there and the Lord speaks to Moses and says, tell Joshua I'll give him this land. I'll give him this land. This will be his land. And so Joshua, Caleb, not Joshua, Caleb, Caleb is standing there and Caleb is surrounded by doubters. Only, the, the only one that, that's with him is, is Joshua. And do you notice, out of, t out of 12 spies, you only know two names? Joshua and Caleb. That's it. That's the only two names you know. You don't know any other names because nobody else had a report of faith. The only ones that mattered were the ones that had a report of faith. <clears throat> and Caleb is 40 years old when he receives this promise. And Caleb walks in the wilderness for 40 years, not because of anything he did, but because the people failed to believe. And so Caleb walked for 40 years in the wilderness, in circles, literally, walking in circles around in the wilderness, holding on to a promise that was given to him because he believed, because he didn't doubt. And so Caleb comes, after they've crossed over to the promised land, Caleb comes to Moses and he says, Moses, or he says, Joshua, God spoke to Moses. God said, gave him a promise, said, this is your land. You can possess this land, it's going to be yours. I was 40 years old then, I'm 85 years old now, and I have held on to this promise. Every step I took in that wilderness, I've reminded myself, I've got a promise. 
every step. I've got a possession. God's already said, I've got a possession. God, I'm going to have part of that land. God's going to give me part of that land. Every step he took, surrounded by doubters, he held on. Let me tell you something. You can be surrounded by people that doubt God, and you can still be full of faith. You can be surrounded by people who have no clue spiritually what's going on and you can still have, have the gift of God stirred up on the inside of you. And that's what Caleb did. Caleb did that for 45 years after walking away from the promised land, knowing they could possess the land. For 45 years, he kept it stirred up on the inside of him. He kept that promise stirred up. He kept that faith stirred up. He kept that fire stirred up. He kept the gift of God stirred up on the inside of him. Because every day he knew, I'm one day closer to my promise. I'm one day closer to claiming what God has said I can have. Oh, somebody, stir up the gift of God. It's got to be personal. You've got to have your own personal revival. <laughs> hallelujah. 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 Stand up tonight, if you would, please. I don't, I, man, i got a lot more pages than i got time. That's all right. It's all right. Because I feel like tonight, tonight is the night to stir it up. Shake it loose. Stir up the gift of God. Sometimes things get a little rusty. Sometimes things get a little clogged up. And we got to shake it up a little bit. And we got to break it loose. Shake it loose. And that old gate, we got to get a hold of it. And we got to stir it up a little bit and begin to open it and work hard to get it open. The Bible said our lamps need to be trimmed and bright. Trimmed and bright. It's going to be a sad day on the coming of the Lord. When the Lord comes back and there's going to be those, there's going to be those whose lamps aren't full. Those have let the oil go down. Let the oil, they didn't bring enough oil with them. And so they're trying to find oil, trying to borrow oil. There's nobody to give them any oil. It's going to be a sad day for people who didn't keep it stirred up. Didn't stir up the gift of God. Yes, God. Sometimes you've got to stir up a calling. Sometimes you've got to stir up a destiny. Sometimes you got to stir up the anointing. Sometimes you got to stir up your holiness. Sometimes you got to stir up your, your faith and the fire. And I want to pray with you tonight. I want the Lord to stir up what's on the inside of you. I want the Lord to stir up what's on the inside of you. You can have a beautiful car. It can be absolutely beautiful. Nice leather interior. All the, all the whistles and gadgets and everything goes with it. But if the battery's dead, the car's not going to run. You've got to have, you've got to be stirred up on the inside of it. Once you make your way to the front tonight, you've got the gift. You've got the gift. You just got to stir it up. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We've not received the spirit of fear, but of love and of power, but of a sound mind. Oh, Jesus. Why don't you lift your hands up tonight? And let's just reach out to